All right. Wonderful. All right. Next up on Big Talk from Small Libraries, we've just wrapped up our lightning rounds. I am Krista Porter, your host here today. Um, our 1 o'clock session is 1 p.m. Central Time. It is here. Okay, it's 1.06 p.m. We're running a little long. Um, cultivating an active learning community at the library. As you can see here, Danielle, uh, Deanna, Ashley Krieg, and Lindsay uh, Shetler, sorry, <laughs> um, from the University of St. Mary in Leavenworth, Kansas, south of us. Are you having a lot of snow down there or is the storm just up here? We are having some light rain. Ah, okay, you got it easy. <laughs> we have wind, uh, snow blowing sideways outside my window. Oh my um, god. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but they're going to tell us about their what they've set up at their um, um, learning center here at the Light University. So I'm just going to hand it right away to you so you can just take it away. Sure, thank you. Again, my name is Danielle Tice Dion, and I'm the library director at the University of St. Mary. I'm here with two of my colleagues, and I'll let them introduce themselves right now. I'm Ashley Creek, and I'm the Emerging Technologies Librarian at the University of St. Mary. And I'm Lindsay Shetler. I'm the Special Collections Librarian here at the University of St. Mary. And what we're going to do is take um, you on a journey. And the journey started around two and a half years ago. And we're really excited to have you um, kind of see what we've done with our library in the last two and a half years and excited to share about the possibilities for where we're going. Okay, so I became the library director here at the University of St. Mary in um, 2014. And when I walked in, I actually did walk into um, 10 card catalogs as the first thing that you saw when you walked into this library. Now we are at an, an academic university with around 800 on-campus students and we do have a very active um, and engaged community here and there really was no um, kind of visibility of the library on campus. Um, we were attempting to do instruction, but not in any holistic manner across disciplines. Um, we had um, a, a wide variety of um, uh, bound periodicals that were here in the library. We had reference materials that had not been weeded. We have around 100,000 circulating materials that had not been weeded for many decades. And um, very small collaborative spaces, no group study spaces, no individual um, study spaces, except in the corner. So our patrons were really pushed into the corners of the library to have any kind of um, individual study spaces. So when I walked in, I um, was um, very excited about the possibility of the building, of where we could go um, with a different strategic plan and vision, and um, had a lot of fun the first year um, engaging the staff and figuring out what we wanted to do. So um, we started brainstorming um, to figure out what could be a new model, and so we knew that um, we wanted to um, create a collaborative, open um, kind of community space where everyone across the campus would feel that the library was something that they could um, come in and um, teach classes in, participate with the librarians in um, instruction, um, hold different um, types of activities in the library. And so for the past two and a half years, we've been working to do that. Now, um, we, we did this all on our own. We um, had the support of the administration to make these changes, but absolutely no funding. And so we actually physically, librarians, took down these shelves. <laughs> we were the ones who were taking the shelving down. We um, kind of went with the model of um, let's show everyone that we're willing to, to work really hard at changing the physical space and making um, big dramatic changes at the library um, just by working hard um, throughout the day. And then hopefully that would garner support of others on campus who would be willing to pitch in either physically um, and also financially as it turned out down the road, which was a wonderful um, addition that we'll speak about. So um, what we ended up um, doing is taking down the first year 24 rows of shelving. 
we had bound periodicals that were sitting in 12 rows um, on one side of our library that actually were not even cataloged. So no one knew that we had these bound periodicals. Um, and, you know, we're in Kansas, so we really didn't need Oklahoma railroads um, as the um, past 25 years of that title. So we did a lot of weeding. Um, we worked with various departments to, to make sure we were keeping items that were relevant for them. Um, we made some very big changes in terms of what physical periodicals we kept or not kept and made some additional purchases and databases for e-content that would be relevant for our users. We do have an online community of students, approximately 500 to 600 online students, and we wanted to make sure that we were being equitable for them in anything that we were purchasing. Um, if it was for a discipline that was relevant for them, for an online student, we really wanted to go um, e-only for that. So, um, over the course of 2014 and 2015, we um, set out um, on our own journey of transforming the library spaces on our own, um, taking down the 24 rows, moving things around, um, repurposing all kinds of um, different tools and, and furniture that we had. And as you can see here, um, we made a lot of messes. So um, we kind of had this philosophy of um, we were going to make these changes and we did have the support of everyone here on campus luckily. Um, I know when you do weeding product, um, projects there is some trepidation um, of what the response will be around campus. Um, we these are all bound periodical volumes that you see here. And we were strategic in that the items that we disposed of, we first wanted to make sure we had an online version of that title if it was relevant for our disciplines. Or if it wasn't relevant, we could justify it by saying this title has really nothing to do with our curriculum. So we were making sure we were covering um, our bases and making sure that we could have logical arguments. However, when we were doing this ourselves, we did make lots of messes. And we did actually have to recruit um, some helpers. And you can see in the bottom right side of the screen, this is our football team. They came and helped us two weekends move out the bound volumes into a paper recycling um, dumpster for us, and we are eternally grateful for them. And they are, are some of our heaviest users here um, in the library now, and we are very grateful for that collaboration. So through that, we um, now have this space. So this is actually the same area where we had that first picture that was very dark and had all of the um, shelving um, that you saw that we took down. This is now our space and we have beautiful LED lighting. We um, still have our old carpet and our goal is to replace that this coming summer actually however the students have moved in and we still have our same furniture um, in these images but the students have been dragging the furniture around creating their own little pods and um, we have beautiful light lighting that comes in from the far side of the building that we would never have seen before with the shelving so this is where we are in around 2015, and um, we were very happy to be at this point. And Ashley is going to um, talk about what we've done since then. So after we cleared these spaces, one of the things that we asked students about was how they wanted us to use and envision our new space. So we simply put up um, some of the big poster sheets, like giant post-it notes, and asked them what they wanted to see. Um, our students are very creative people. Um, they love the idea of study rooms, but then there's also the people who wanted us to add Starbucks, showers, a condo. Um, <laughs> They love the idea of couches, and they love the idea of open space. Um, so we were able to take some of these feedback and enjoy our students' sense of humor, but also see what they wanted us to add, really. So 
our students have really moved into and claimed ownership of the new space that we've created. Um, we host poster sessions. We host um, large sessions with our entire first year experience. So the entire freshman class can come into the library. We're one of the only places on campus where that is even physically possible and hold events and gather together. And then we still got a long way to go. A few, the following summer, our next big project was this large center room in the library. And it was over 2,000 square feet of space that had previously been used by one employee. <laughs> um, so a large space that was not necessarily getting its optimum usage. That summer, we spent the time to clean out the space and then Actually, for the next year, we partnered with maintenance to use folding chairs and tables <laughs> at, to use it as a teaching space and event space on campus. We were able to host, I think, 32 events over the course of that year, and we considered ourselves pretty hot stuff for doing that. Um, but then we took it and went a little bigger. <laughs> okay, it's Danielle again. Um, over the course of that year, as we used the space for um, instruction, Sessions, um, sessions and um, different activities with other faculty members and different departments, we learned about the Steelcase Education Active Learning Grant. And this grant is, um, at this time in 2016, was valued at $62,000. And it provided um, an, an active learning um, technology lab that was um, could be in any kind of space um, at a university, a middle school, or a high school. And so we were a little bit wary about applying for this because um, a, a library has, has never received it before. And so we didn't know if we really were going to meet the qualifications for what was needed. But um, after a couple days of, of thinking we wouldn't do it, we just decided to jump in and um, tried to pull it off. And, and we pulled it off within one week. And so we were um, a really great um, team um, trying to figure out all different aspects of what was needed for the grant application. So um, we went ahead and have shared our grant application with you. You are very welcome to go to this link and actually see all of our grant application materials. Um, we did talk about our transformation of the space, um, the of um, not only the 2,000 square foot room that we were wanting to create the Active Learning Center in, um, but also just our transformation of the library in general. Um, we also um, created a pedagogy, an active learning pedagogy, and I'll share that in the next slide. Um, and then we also had assessment, an assessment cycle where we were going to actually evaluate the usage of the room and the impact of the room on our campus. Um, and so we um, have all of those materials available for you, um, and you are very welcome to go and, and um, utilize that in any capacity as you would like to. Um, as part of um, this process of applying, we decided that we needed to learn more about active learning itself. And so my colleague Ashley um, developed an active learning resource center for our campus. And um, the link is available here um, as well. And what was great about that is that not only did we acquire some print materials that our faculty and staff could use in their own teaching and learning, but we also found some excellent online materials that faculty and staff could use as well. And so all of that is, is listed and available in the Resource, resource Center um, guide as well. Our grant narrative is, is available as well and, and kind of our um, logic arguments for why we felt we um, were a good candidate for this grant. Um, we were um, highlighted by Steelcase Education as, um, an, as an excellent example of this grant application and they have been sharing our application with others um, for the 2017 grant cycle. And um, we also were one of the recipients of Steelcase sending a video team to come and highlight our usage of the room 
um, and we'll talk about our usage um, coming up shortly. But the video for um, um, for us that was created by Steelcase is also available on our grant application page. We have that there, so please feel free to take a look at that. This is our camp our campus active learning philosophy that we came up with. Um, USM instructors facilitate the creation of a student learner centered environment through creative active learning curriculum strategies that increase student and social learning, collaboration, critical thinking skills, knowledge creation, creativity, and experimentation. Our pedagogy is centered on continuous instructor to student engagement, peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities, meta-literacy, and multiple teaching modes designed to meet visual, auditory, and kinesthetic student learning styles. Instructors utilize innovative, flexible, and interactive spaces and instructional technology tools to facilitate active learning and wisdom formation and espouse a culture of assessment. What was wonderful about um, this process is that it has generated kind of a fire in our faculty and staff in using active learning techniques and, and actually sharing them with each other. We um, have since, the, since receipt of this grant created a center for teaching and learning on campus and it actually is held here in the library and our faculty and staff come together and we're um, trying to increase the amount of active learning um, pedagogies here on campus and it's a, a wonderful um, collaboration and a wonderful outcome that has happened as a result of this grant and we'll discuss a little bit more about that as we move forward. Here's a screenshot of the Active Learning Resource Center page that I mentioned earlier, and you are very welcome to come and um, take a look at that as well. Okay, we are going to transition um, to Lindsay. Um, I have a quick question, Danielle. Yes. Um, that just popped up that might be a good point right now to because it just got asked. Someone wants to know, what is the definition of meta-literacy? Sure. Um, well, it's <laughs> have multiple um, definitions and my colleagues can jump in um, after I share something but for me meta literacy is more than information literacy it's a combination of digital literacy information literacy um, so meta would just be kind of more anyone else you wanna... need to be you need to be aware and understand all of it it's more than just knowing information, it's knowing how to use it and how to present it in different ways. So kind mm -hmm. of the holistic view of knowledge rather than necessarily just focusing on one aspect of it. I like that, the holistic. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so um, after we won the Steelcase grant, um, the renovation took place in that middle room, um, which is now the Active Learning Center. Um, it was, the renovation took over the summer for six weeks, and um, USM did provide um, additional funds uh, to uh, have new lighting, um, new paint, new cabinetry, things of that nature. Um, and then this is what the renovation looks like. So this is what the room looks like now. Um, as you can see, uh, the grant included a smart whiteboard um, there that's on the right. And then there's also some tables and chairs and everything is mobile. So everything can be moved easily and is accessible um, for transitions for um, groups, um, group projects, uh, classroom collaboration, things of that nature, as well as being lightweight. Um, so it's really functional um, compared to the traditional classroom furniture, which is stationary or too large. Um, that really um, puts barriers up for any type of active learning. And then here's another picture. Um, this one shows some of our amazing whiteboards that um, you can take uh, anywhere in the library and use. Um, and they also have little slots on the tables that you can uh, provide the, the whiteboards to create dividers and things of that nature. Um, they're also sustainable, so you won't have to use posters for um, any type of group projects and presenting in class. You can just go straight to the whiteboards and use those. Um, they're easy to erase and clean um, as well. 
And, and then here's a picture of just the, the tall uh, chairs and tables that we also uh, received. And so as a result, um, this active learning center um, brought over 240 formal activities in the space um, thus far. And um, here is a list of all the courses taught. Um, what we've noticed is that the health sciences use the whiteboards a lot for concept mapping, problem-based learning. Um, we also have introduced um, other act, uh, active learning um, tools, such as a 3D printer um, and board games and a makerspace, which Ashley will talk about in a little bit. Um, but that has provided us with additional tools to bring into the center and to really um, have the library provide instruction um, in new ways that incorporate into active learning. And then here's a shot of some of our students who are studying in the in the center. Um, as a result of this grassroots pro program, the library is providing technology um, and introducing um, classes in technology and workshops in technology. And we're fostering a collaborative space for students, faculty, and the community. Um, this has really brought the faculty and the library together um, to form new partnerships and start new conversations. Um, with each other and how we can incorporate information literacy um, and active learning into um, the campus as a whole. And here's another um, community usage for this space as well. Um, there's, in addition to the list here, there's been um, professional poster sessions that have been held here. We have one uh, going on right now as well. Um, we have faculty senate um, that is held here. Uh, we just finished senior success day um, as well. That took over the whole library, actually, um, which is new for us. And then also uh, student-led events for clubs and unions has become really popular in using this space to kind of come together and, and create these clubs and unions and um, and have this other students on campus participate in events here as well. We've become kind of the hub. And then um, also, I wanted to touch that um, because of this experience, we've also become the driving force to expanding library outreach to the Leavenworth community as well, which was not something that was at, um, as a priority um, with this. Uh, program, but it has opened the doors to uh, events that have taken place here where we have partnered with um, outside community um, businesses and um, and just the people in general as well. Um, we just had a donation for special collections um, acquired, and so we were able to have a dedication ceremony here as in the, the library and kind of um, familiarize the community with this space and what we're doing. And as we've gone through all these changes, one of the things that has been at the top of our minds is making sure that we really are focusing on our students and the space that they need, what our campus needs the library to be. Um, so one of the things that we've that is a happy side effect of this is that we've moved as part of the campus plan from a renovation five to six years down the line to a renovation that we are actively fundraising for right now. <laughs> um, so as part of the idea to get more student feedback on what kind of space we want to build, we're fortunate to be in the Kansas City metro area and have institutions that are at least comparable size that have done recent renovations within driving distance. And while it's not necessarily practical to take 40 students on a bus ride to look at other libraries, it was possible to take two students and another librarian on a visit to view other libraries and take f enough photos and give a virtual tour that we could bring back to campus and ask students what they think of how these other libraries re envision their spaces. So we can use those that feedback to talk through our future renovation and make sure that we're really creating a kind of space that our students want and how they can envision using it. And as Lindsay mentioned before, as part of our 
um, push towards active learning, we've created um, more makerspace tools. That's actually ha how my title is now the Emerging Technologies Librarian. I was the librarian formerly known as Access Services. Um, and part of this is that I love technology and researching it for other people. We've added a 3D printer, a large format poster printer, and we've actually started repurposing um, the cabinets that you see on the slide are former microfilm cabinets. <laughs> um, since the microfilm has not been used in the six years that I've been here, we decided to empty the microfilm out into boxes and are currently using them to store all sorts of tools, like yarn fits amazingly in microfilm cabinets, along with um, scissors, cutting mats, all types of tools that our students can use, and our philosophy with all of these technologies, um, students book time on the 3D printer by emailing me and we print things on demand. Um, there's currently no cost for that for them. On the large format printer, we're just trying to keep ourselves solvent in ink, so they can print anything for $2 a foot, which is significantly a significant savings over our local Kinkos. Um, and anything that they want to use in the makerspace cabinets, they are free to take and use inside the library, outside the library. Um, materials are consumed and will replace them over time, and tools they can take and then just bring back. We're also adding more circulating technology to our active learning. Um, we have started a board game collection that is very popular for recreational play, but is also gaining traction in the classroom um, as more professors experiment with using games as learning technology. We also have several video projects, so we're adding more video technology, including um, tripods, tablet mounts. Um, we're looking at adding a GoPro and some robots for students to explore how to combine coding and those types of active learning. Um, our education students are seeing this as they go forth into education classrooms, so this is their opportunity to play with them before they go on to write grants for these types of technologies in their schools. As part of this active learning movement that we've had, we were able to partner this semester with the honors section of the first year experience and have a built-in audience for a tech um, tech-based lunch lecture series. Lunchtime is a big time for speeches on our campus because it's the one time when there are no classes. Um, and if we provide a little bit of dessert, people will show up for talks. So we were able to host a four-week series talking through game design, social media, cybersecurity, and makerspaces, and bring in speakers both from across campus and from our local community to introduce our students to these larger tech topics that are um, going to be things that they have to deal with in their lives. We also are continuing to scaffold this learning throughout the rest of the FYE Honor section this semester. They will all be doing 15 hours of service learning with us, so they, will, they are actually proposing individual tech projects that they will be doing in service for the library. So some of the students have decided that they're going to create items for us to 3D print and use as promotional materials for the library, as well as creating tutorials on how to use a 3D printer. Um, there are others who are um, creating videos about our spaces and how students can use them, others creating videos about um, our equipment and how it can be used, and a small group of students who are doing usability studies to ask our um, other parts of campus to see if we can create a library tab on our campus learning management system. So they have taken the initiative and are really seeing how they want the library to interact with their student lives. Yeah, and so with Special Collections, we're also doing active learning projects um, with Special Collections. And part of the FYE Honors um, project that Ashley was just talking about, we are also um, incorporating a um, digital exhibit project for the students to complete uh, using our digital collection and uh, learning how to um, 
select content, research the content, uh, research supplemental uh, material, um, how to upload that to WordPress, which will be uh, where they would create their actual digital exhibit, um, and just really kind of become familiar with the primary sources that are in special collections and um, on our digital collection as well. Um, other things we're doing in special collections is primarily focusing on um, hands-on activities to learn about primary sources as well as digital humanities initiatives. Um, and so a few examples I have uh, last or last spring, um, I um, uh, instructed a class for about three weeks um, and they came into special collections and they had a student curated project. Um, and so they got to look through all the material and choose an item that they wanted uh, to focus on and research, and then they all kind of had to come together and create a theme uh, to where they would then um, create facsimiles of the items and uh, mount them to film board and do the whole installation for the exhibit as well. And um, this, these are all the pictures from that, that project, um, and that was a lot of fun. And they really got to see kind of what um, uh, what I do and um, how you can utilize the primary sources and how you can research them and how you can interpret them and analyze them in, in new ways rather than just uh, me kind of showing them a book and them not being able to touch it. Um, and another um, other projects that we've been working on is we've had education students come up who their projects had to do with creating lesson plans for K through 12 kids. Um, going to museums and things of that nature. So I've let them use the special collections area to um, help them build those lesson plans and how to utilize um, framed artwork and artifacts and how to help students K through 12 interpret those and, um, and analyze them themselves. And so it's just been a lot of fun to be able to, to create some hands-on activities that you don't traditionally see in special collections instruction classes as well. And so as you might be able to tell, going from 32 activities to 240 has been a sharp change. Um, we were managing the space by creating a library-specific outlet calendar. Um, and adding everything to that location. The problem with that is if any one of us is out of town and somebody reaches out to us to reserve a space, it's very hard to do from off campus. It's very hard to let people see what spaces might be reserved in the library so that they can do planning. We have a couple, we have about five power users <laughs> for our spaces. Um, and one of the things that we're doing this semester is we've actually I know several of you probably use LibGuides or at least have seen LibGuides. Um, they also have a scheduling app called LibCal and we're currently using that to manage our spaces um, in a trial run and given access to our power users so that they can start planning out their events in advance. Um, it allows us to do mediation and make sure that um, people are not necessarily booking out large chunks of the library for days and days on end, but it also lets us create uh, more useful statistics on what types of events are being held in the library and um, who is hosting them. Um, we're also investing in the equipment manager from the same platform so that we can do checkouts for technology. Um, we have been running the checkouts through our um, normal ILS system, but the LibCal version allows us to embed like the product manual so I don't have to check them out with the technology. And it also forces students to acknowledge that they are responsible. There's a little form that you can embed that um, before students can check out the technology, they have to acknowledge that they are financially responsible for the technology and read through the parameters before they can complete their booking. So that's a really nice functional touch for those of us who need to make sure that we can charge people if they don't return things. 
Okay, this is Danielle again. So at this point, we have shared um, all of the major content that we would like to share with you, and we would love to, to hear from you. Um, we'd be very interested in hearing any active learning story that you would like to share with the group, as well as any questions that you would propose to ask um, any of us regarding the, the topics that we've shared. Great. Thank you, Danielle and Ashley and Lindsay. That was uh, very cool. Love seeing the amazing changes <laughs> that happened in the library. Um, one of my first impressions, I don't know if many other people may have had the same thing, <laughs> when I saw the, um, well, the library catalog still in the <laughs> library, my first, actually, my first reaction was, oh, wow, cool. And then, what did they do with them? Like, cause those are so, you know, People love to have them now in their houses, or especially librarians, to get you know to get them for their own use. <laughs> right, um, when they're no longer been used in the library, when they're like you know, weeded out. <laughs> Of course, we we currently have them still in the building. Um, we oh, okay. will we will give um, one or two to the development office for um, kind of an um, auction um, at some point. We we just have not done that yet. So we're still we're still holding on to them. Um, and you know, I've heard some great stories of repurposing them for like wine cabinets. You know, there's some really great. Oh yeah, yeah, options. very. They're very much in demand in certain areas, yeah. <laughs> All right, we do have some actual questions, though, about your presentation. <laughs> um, if anybody does have any questions, do type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. I can see them here and pass them on to our presenters. Um, all right, we have questions about the 3D printing. Uh, do you limit your 3D printing to school projects? If so, how do you monitor that, um, especially when you're not charging a fee for it? No, we don't. Um, we bought a printer that um, I would highly recommend for anybody who would, is just getting into 3D printing. It's called the PrinterBot Play, and it retailed for $400. Um, a reel of material cost $12, and so the individual items that we're capable of printing are really costing us like 12 cents or less. Um, and just while we're currently building demand for it, um, I keep it running 99% of the time. Um, we put it at the front desk and just have it running printing. I cannot tell you how many Pikachus I have printed over the course of this past year. Um, got to test with something. <laughs> got to test with something, and students love a giveaway. Um, now that we've been giving stuff away and showing examples up at the front desk, um, we also give them like to the president of our college. Um, we have the Lincoln collection and special collections, so we've printed a bunch of Lincoln busts. And so, as people come to campus um, to relate to that collection, we'll give them a 3D printed bust of Lincoln. It's a way to build goodwill towards the library. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're actually seeing because faculty and students are more aware of the printer's existence. Um, we're actually 3D printing stuff for the physics class for an egg drop project. And an education student has me printing farm animals today for um, a project with for her elementary school theoretical class. Um, the usage is growing just because we weren't afraid to spend the money on filament. <laughs> right. Yeah, you have the money to put out for that, yeah. Yeah. Um, my question is, since you're talking about the 3D printers, I'm going to jump down to this one. Um, how reliable has this one been for you? Does it break down often? Because I, I know previously I you know hear a lot about different um, uh, maker spaces and, and people having good and not so good luck with the different brands and types of 3D printers that are out there. I will what say the one I, you guys have? I, I picked this one because I saw a review video where a guy climbed on top of it while it was printing. Um, <laughs> That oh, was wow. a strong influencing factor. Um, I've taken ours apart three times. I will say that if you are uncomfortable with the idea of taking a 3D printer apart, I would strongly recommend finding somebody on your staff who is less afraid. Um, mm. Dismantling seems to be something that is intrinsically built into 3D printers. Um, but I will tell you that particularly with this model, the cost of replacement technology and the 
accessibility of instructions has really made it easy to troubleshoot when we have had problems and we've broken down a surprisingly few number of times. That's good. Um, yeah, it does seem like that you have to be either comfortable with it or a mechanically inclined person, which some of librarians are and some aren't, to, to be able to have to deal with them when they're so, can be very uh, picky, temperamental, and what, what they work or not, yeah. Can you give what the name of the one is that you, the model that you have again? Repeat what um, that was again. PrinterBot Play, and PrinterBot does not have an E in printer. Uh. Ah, okay. One of those, got it. <laughs> so printer bot play, got it. Um, I was must know to what was the name of the scheduling app that you used again? To repeat that, what was that that uh -huh. we were using? It's from SpringShare. It's called LibCal. Let me go back and see if I can. There it is. Uh, it just kind of shows you a screenshot of what it looks like on the right. So L I B C A L, mm -hmm. similar kind of. Um, Acronym and shortening of the other things that SpringShare does. Yes. <laughs> uh, oh, and here's another one that is common to many um, libraries. Have you interested introduced food or drink or any sort of a cafe into the library yet, or is that that is in the plans? Um, yeah, I. We know that we'll probably have some type of kiosk for coffee, but it won't be where we'll have, you know, a, a barista or anything. It'll be um, serve yourself um, type of coffee station. Mm -hmm. And then we do also have um, the, why am I blinking on what it's called, um, for students, um, the hunger Oh, we have actually become a location on campus. Um, we have a student-run food pantry um, that's donations for students, by students, and it's located here in the library um, because it was seen as a place that students gather without stigma. Yeah, mm -hmm. and our, our Active Learning Center currently has a little um, a food station where you there's a little fridge, a sink, um, a Keurig and a microwave, so students are welcome to use any of those. Okay. So it seems like at your in your at your university, having some sort of a actual like full blown cafe of some sort in the library is already being handled by other other places around campus. Correct. Yeah. And um, there, we do make exceptions um, for every week, every year for finals week, every semester that we have finals, um, the library provides coffee. Um, for the full amount of time that we are open, and we just bought a 40 cup coffee pot, and we brew coffee from sun up till close. Yeah, and um, <laughs> since we have events during lunchtime in the Active Learning Center, uh, the departments who host those uh, usually pay for um, catering of some nature. You know, wh wh whether that be just pizza or um, something like a taco bar or something like that. And so that's actually uh, in the ALC and um, when that's, I mean, a lot of people come for the food as well as the lecture, but it's it seems usually like there's food. always some type of food line in the library without us having to create it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And you did say you offer, what was it, uh, sweets or something to entice them for one of them. I think you mentioned oh, food is always a good draw, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> So that's one thing. Always, definitely don't, you know, always allow food in your library in some way so that you can offer that yourself. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. All right. Um, any other questions um, for these guys? Um, I see you brought up that you've got this grant writing libguide here. Um, this is good for anyone also. I, in a previous, in one of our previous sessions today, someone had asked about how do you find out about these grants, the, one, the best small library in America one this morning. Here's a good resource for you. You guys have obviously put together some sort of a, a place with the resources for that. Yes, based on, um, actually, I went to a grant writing workshop with Scott Rice, which is our local Steelcase dealer, and that's where I learned about the Steelcase grant. <laughs> yeah. And they also taught us how to find other grants. <laughs> yeah, great, okay. So here's a resource for anybody looking to get more money in, um, for um, th doing things at their libraries. 
And, and this, I mean, one thing to recommend with grant writing is, you know, we all look at IMLS and NEH and things of that nature that are directed towards libraries, but the Steelcase grant wasn't necessarily directed there. So looking outside of the box and, and a little bit more regional also can, can help provide funding in unique ways. Oh, sure. Um, look to your state library or library commission. We here, we offer grants through our Nebraska Library Commission to all libraries in the state. So um, look local and look national and just get creative, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we'll wrap it up then for this session. We got You guys got us right back on schedule. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Of course. Um, I have another poll.